There are two times where he will come back. The one time where we meet him in the air, called the rapture of the church. His feet will not touch the earth. And then the second coming, where he actually touches the ground. It says the Mount of Olivet will actually split in two, because the glory of Christ will be so great that the earth won't even be able to touch him. It just won't be able to hold him. It'll just split. And that's been prophesied in God's word. And so we await. Jesus Christ has not come back, but we wait with anticipation for that right. return. Right. Uh, Jehovah Witness Atonement of Christ. They believe that the Atonement of Christ allows them opportunity to, to work their way to heaven. Now, I'm glad I don't go to heaven by my works. I go to heaven by faith in what Jesus Christ, he did the works. That's right. I just receive of that by placing my faith in what Jesus has done. Christ was a ransom to God for Adam's sin. This is a quote by, by them. So what's the difference by Fritz uh, Renoir? Jesus, the perfect human, was redemption for Adam's sin. And being such, he made it possible for all mankind to be saved. How then is mankind saved? Through works. <laughs> And perfect obedience to Jehovah and being and doing exactly what the WB, uh, WTBTS, the Watchtower Bible and Track Society, teaches. So even 100% obedience to Jehovah is not enough. You've also got to do exactly what the, the organization tells, tells you to. Again, and that's a, that's a mark of a cult. The yes. mark of a cult is when they demand 100% obedience from their members or else you cannot be saved. And here we see that's what they're demanding. In 1914, let's go back to that date. When and how is a perfect government established? When Jesus was on earth, this kingdom was the main theme of his preaching. Matthew 4, 17 and Luke 8, 1. However, he did not establish the kingdom at that time, nor at his resurrection, Acts 1, 6 to 8. Even when he ascended into heavens, he still had to wait for Jehovah's appointed time. Psalm 110, 1, 2, and Hebrews 1, 13. Bible prophecy shows that appointed time came in 1914. Where? Show me where it said that it came in 1914. There's no scripture that they could use, that they could point to, that would say that Jesus Christ came back invisibly in 1914. How convenient. Invisibly. I could make a promise. Matter of fact, we had, we had, a, we had a preacher once visiting Family Worship Center that said Jesus Christ was going to physically appear on Friday night. And he never physically appeared. But you can say, well, he, he appeared, but he appeared invisibly. You know, the Bible says because two or three are gathered here in his name, and he's here in the midst of us right now. I can say it right now. He's here. But this is different. This is something that they had prophesied was the second return of Christ, and it did not happen as they said it was going to happen. Now, let's look at the fact that they deny the Trinity. Now, the Trinity, to me, is dear to my heart. I believe in the doctrines of the Trinity. I, I, I really have a hard time seeing people not see the Trinity in the Scriptures. I see it everywhere in the Scripture, but they deny the Trinity. There was, there was there a more there was never was there a more deceptive doctrine advanced than that of the Trinity. This is reconciliation, 1928. Sincere persons who want to know the true God and serve Him find it a bit difficult to love and worship a complicated, freakish-looking, three-headed God. Let God be true, 1946. Now, we don't have a three-headed God. No. That's not what we're talking about. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's not one body with three heads sticking out of it. But it's easy to mock that. It's easy to come up with that, and so they, they use that. Satan is the originator of the Trinity doctrine. Let God be true. Satan is not the originator of any true doctrine. He's the originator of every false doctrine. And so this is how, this is their teaching again. This is a rebuttal to that. It is true the word Trinity does not exist in the Bible. You can find it, you're not going to see it through there. But the Holy Scriptures gives the evidence of the Trinity. You're not going to see the word Trinity, you're not going to see the word rapture. But it's very clear in the Scripture. Let us make man in our image, Genesis 1.26. The personal pronoun there is in plural. Now, who's the hour? Now, one of people say it's, it's, it's God and the angels. No, 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 because the image of God is different than the image of the angels. God is made different. God is not made different. God is different than the created beings called the angels. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, let's look at the scripture a little bit. First of all, all authority has been given to me. If this was oneness doctrine, and I know we're not talking UPC, but if it was just oneness doctrine, who gave him that authority? It, you, you wouldn't say that. Oh, I give myself authority. No, you would all you would say I have the authority. And then it says, baptize the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we see very clearly the Trinity again in Scripture. The okay, mark of the archangel became the incarnate Christ. At times, individuals are known by more than one name. For example, the patriarch Jacob is also known as Israel. The apostle Peter was also Simon, Genesis 49, 1 and 2, and Matthew 10, 2. Likewise, the Bible indicates that Michael is another name for Jesus Christ before and after his life on earth. I, 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 maybe I should not chuckle at this, but I just find it. It's really stretching. It it's really, really stretching. Right. And just and there's no proof here. There's no biblical proof that Michael the Archangel is Jesus Christ. And that's a very weak argument. Jesus is linked with the office of the Archangel. Regarding the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a commanding call, with an archangel's voice. Thus the voice of Jesus is described as being that of an archangel. The scripture therefore suggests that Jesus himself is Michael the archangel. The fact that an angel, that an archangel is announcing the return of Christ does not mean that Jesus has the voice of an archangel. We see here that this scripture is improperly interpreted. And you've got to, again, you use your Bible when you're ministering to people of other religions. So you can see it accurately, because it does not say that clearly. The Bible says that Michael and his angels battle with the dragon and its angels. Thus Michael, this is Revelation uh, chapter 12, thus Michael is the leader of the army of faithful angels. Revelation also describes Jesus as the leader of an army of faithful angels. So the Bible speaks both of Michael and his angels and Jesus and his angels. Since God's word nowhere indicates that there are two armies of the faithful angels in heaven, one headed by Michael and one headed by Jesus, it's logical to conclude that Michael is none other than Jesus Christ in his heavenly role. Does that make sense to you? No. It doesn't. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like officially in the United States, the head of the army is the president of the United States. Am I correct on that? Right. He's a commander in chief. So it's basically the army under his leadership. But in battle, does he go out or does he send his, his generals? So the general is leading the army, but in reality, officially on paper, the president's leading the army. So the fact that the scripture uses both terms does not in any way, shape, or form prove that Michael the Archangel became Jesus Christ. Okay, what happens after death? Death is the opposite of life. This is from Watchtower.org, their website. Death is the opposite of life. The dead do not see or hear or think. Not even one part of us survives the death of the body. We do not possess an immortal soul or spirit. Rodani, what's your opinion? Do we have an immortal soul? <laughs> no. you know, soul yeah. lives forever. Yeah. Our soul spirit, spirit soul lives forever. When we die, the spirit and the soul of man goes to be up yeah, with the Lord. Absolutely. Immediately. We Later on, the, the body joins. It's, it's forever. It's forever. They teach a form of annihilationism. The wicked will be eternally destroyed. So this is almost a science fiction kind of the death uh, ray that, that they're talking about here, that God is going to destroy. One of the primary reasons Russell stated uh, started his own religion was because of the biblical teaching of eternal conscious punishment. The same reason that Joseph Smith started his was because the scripture was clear that there was going to be eternal punishment for the wicked and Joseph Smith was involved in, in different forms of, uh, of uh, clairvoyance and witchcraft. And so both of them decided they just start their own religion. Just start your own religion. Yeah. If you don't like the fact that there's an accountability for your, for your actions and that there is punishment to those who do not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you start your own religion. Uh, this is from Six Myths of Christianity, Watchtower.org. Hell is a myth. At death, a person ceases to exist. Again, from the Watchtower website there. After one's death, he is still subject to, no, this is a question they pose. After one's death, is he still subject to further punishment for sins? And he quotes out of Romans 6, 7. He who has died has been acquitted from his sins. 
Reasoning from Scriptures, and this is the book I have right here, Reasoning from Scriptures, and this is a book that every Jehovah Witness is supposed to have, and this is what they use to interpret the Scripture, page 174. Here is a common example of the Scripture taken out of Scripture, out of context, to support Watchtower theology. Now this is from the Expositor. For he who is dead, Brother Swaggart's comment, he who was, he was our substitute, and in the mind of God, we died with him upon believing faith. Back to the scripture, is free from sin. Brother Swaggart's commentary, said free from the bondage of the sin nature. So we see very clearly, and anybody who's done any studying of Romans 6 knows that Paul is dealing with the sin nature. In context, let's look at this. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, then henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Now, this is not talking about the physical death of the body. It's talking about us being dead to the sin nature. It's talking about not letting the right. sin nature rule in us. Because we're supposed to be alive with him. Verse 9. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he lived, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This scripture was taken out of context. It was not dealing with the physical death. But it's talking about us being dead to that drawing, the, the, the sin nature trying to draw us into sin. Again, uh, improper usage of scripture. Romans 6 to 8, we have the sin nature, the sanctification in Christ, and the fruit of the message of the cross. And so when you study it, that's how you study it. You understand what it is. The verse in question is in the middle of Paul's discussion on God's desire that we should be set free from the influence of sin nature. We should be dead to that. And that was a term that Jews meant, used a lot. I am dead to you, or you are dead to me. It didn't mean that they were physically dead. It meant I don't want anything to do with you. It is not dealing with the physical death of a sinner, but the freedom from the influence of the wages of sin to those dead to sin and alive to Christ. And the scripture has to be interpreted properly. So when Jehovah's Witnesses come and they try to use the scripture, please get your expositor out. And look at it with them and read it to them. Who knows? They may just change their point of view by what's brought forth there. Now let's look at the salvation and what they teach. Only Jehovah Witnesses, those of the anointed remnant and the great crowd, as a united organization under the protection of the supreme organizer, have any spiritual hope of surviving the impending end of this doomed system dominated by Satan the devil. And that's by Watchtower, 1989. September 1st, uh, page 19. Now, there are two groups of people that are talking about that. The anointed remnant and the great crowd. That's 144,000. And then the, the Jehovah Witnesses that are living under the rule of the uh, Bible, of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Similarly, Jehovah is using only one organization today to accomplish his will. To receive everlasting life in this earthly paradise, we must identify that organization and serve God as part of it. And of course, they say they are that organization. The Watchtower a Bible Attractive Society. This was from uh, 1983, uh, February 15th, page 12. Isn't it 